So as already mentioned, um, today's topic is uh, 3D pattern transfer. That's uh, about how to uh, actually transfer the structures written in a, a resist uh, with another phraser into some other materials. But before I go into uh, all the details, let's revisit the uh, feature of the underfraser that Emine already referred to briefly. So the uh, very high uh, accuracy uh, 3D patterning capability. That's based on the so-called uh, closed loop lithography principle. So what happens uh, during the writing of the underfraser is that we have a hot tip evaporating the polymer from here shown from the left to the right, uh, pixel by pixel. And then um, at the end of each line, the, the tip turns back from left, right to the left here in the image and image is the same line. It's just wrote with a cold tip uh, in a contact mode, kind of an AFM uh, image. And uh, actually what it does, uh, it then um, feeds back the, um, the measured depth data um, to the um, software. And there's an algorithm that adapts the patterning depth uh, so it compares the written depth to the uh, desired depth and adjusts the force acting between the tip and the, and the substrate um, accordingly. So it's, if it's writing too shallow, it will add more force and vice versa. So this, of course, uh, will decrease the total fabrication time. So we will have uh, uh, adaptation of the patterning every few milliseconds. So we will have a very good uh, quality of the patterning from the very begin on. And uh, of course, uh, as a nice side product, we always get a topography image of the pattern that we just wrote without having any additional effort at all. <clears throat> uh, what, 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 what is the nicest thing about it is that it enables us to, um, to pattern 3D patterns uh, with uh, sub nanometer resolution in the Z direction. So for example, here on the left hand side, we can see uh, an example of a continuous sine wave written with an underfraser. Here in the beginning, uh, you can see uh, when the feedback uh, actually finds the right uh, force. So the first couple of lines are not written correctly, but it very quickly adapts the force of the patterning. And eventually the rest of the pattern is written with uh, less than one nanometer uh, error in the Z. And of course, for the next uh, written frame, it remembers the settings and it will look perfect uh, from the very beginning on. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, we can see another example uh, of a checkerboard with 16 discrete uh, depth levels with 1.5 nanometer um, depth differences between each of them. And here in this case, the error is uh, less than 0.7 nanometers. And actually um, uh, this kind of patterns, uh, I would say it's not possible to fabricate uh, with any other existing technology, at least with such, such a, a small error. So here's an actual uh, application example of uh, uh, 3D structures written in, in the PPA, um, our uh, workhorse resist. Uh, so here on the left hand side, we can see uh, the surface topography measured by AFM of a uh, cow's tendon uh, section. And on the right hand side, the same uh, structure replicated in the PPA resist with an underfraser. And this can be used for studying the role of topographical signals in cell matrix interactions. So we can actually study, uh, 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 yeah, for example, cell cultures on uh, uh, structures that resemble very closely uh, the biological sample, but uh, with maybe some additional uh, features or, or uh, with a different, uh, uh, with just the topography and not, not the other biological uh, uh, constituents. Uh, but actually, uh, as much as we like PPA, we have to admit that PPA is not the ideal material for most applications, even if it can be used for many applications already as such. Um, but actually, we, we, we need to also be able to transfer the 3D patterns in other materials as well, which will make this uh, 3D patterning uh, much more useful. Now, the first uh, technique I will present is uh, reactive ion etching, which may be uh, the most intuitive uh, uh, to most uh, uh, people involved in nanofabrication. Uh, it's a very commonly used technique. And also that's what uh, we looked into first. The principle is, is very simple. So we have a, a layer of PPA that has been spin coated uh, on a substrate where we wish to, um, to transfer the 3D patterns. Uh, then we use the nanofraser to, to make the 3D patterns in the PPA. 
and then we uh, apply uh, suitable reactive ion etching uh, recipe. So, of course, the gases and the parameters have been adjusted to, to match the substrate material uh, in question. Uh, but actually, uh, yes, I want to introduce a couple of uh, uh, small tricks that we, we use, actually. So first of all, um, we won't be able to pattern to the very bottom, so we won't be able to remove all of the, the resist with the nanofraser because the substrate acts as a heat sink and it cools down the nanofraser tip as the tip is approaching the substrate. So what we normally do, we, we apply a, a very thin uh, PMMA layer uh, between the PPA and the substrate. Uh, it's simply um, um, thinned down uh, PMMA uh, that has been spin coated and baked and it acts as a thermal buffer layer, which actually allows us to pattern a bit closer to the substrate surface as uh, if we only would have the PPA uh, layer. And this allows us, of course, to reduce the, the reactive iron etching time. And also we will have a, a little bit uh, uh, less roughness and also maybe less contamination of the areas outside of the desired uh, structures. Another thing that we can see here in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the image is that we have a, actually a recess around the pattern. So kind of a frame that has been uh, sunk a little bit into, the, into the, uh, the PPA. And actually this helps us in finding the right uh, etching time. So we don't have to stop the etching exactly where the, the top of the 3D patterns is, but we actually uh, have a recess that is 10 to 15 nanometers deep and we aim to stop the etching uh, within uh, the recess. So we have a, a broadened uh, cross pro process window for the patterning. So ideally, uh, this after the ideal um, uh, etching time has passed, so we actually have a little bit of residual uh, polymer still remaining here, but all our uh, uh, pattern has been etched fully and the polymer has just been removed uh, fully um, uh, outside of the, the 3D pattern itself. And actually, this will enable, <coughs> excuse me, enable us to, to then remove the uh, residual polymer using a solvent, and we will have much less uh, uh, contamination than on the uh, unaffected parts. So, for example, we, if we use a fluorine-containing gas, uh, fluorine is uh, notorious for uh, relieving very difficult to remove uh, residuals on the samples. And if we have still part of the sample uh, covered uh, with a, a polymer after the etching, uh, we are on a good way to get rid of most of this contamination later. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. So uh, here we have a 3D hologram pattern. So we have a, a eight level um, computer generated hologram. Actually, if you shine a laser on it, this is just uh, the full pattern is seen here on the top. If you shine a laser on it, it will show the, uh, the logo of the Swiss Lethal, the former uh, uh, Swiss Lethal. Uh, the total size is 10 by 10 microns and uh, 250,000 pixels. And uh, we should uh, acknowledge Professor Dong, uh, who uh, kindly let us use uh, his pattern. Uh, so we wrote the, the pattern then uh, into the PPA with an nanofraser. It took one minute uh, to write and also to acquire this image. Uh, each of the, the levels were eight nanometers uh, deep within the PPA and the total thickness of the PPA was 90 nanometers. Um, afterwards, the resist um, uh, was used as an etching mask to etch uh, the, the pattern into a, a silicon substrate using SF6 and C4F8. And in this particular case, we uh, achieved an amplification of depth in, uh, in the range of 10, in excess of 10, 10 times. So that the final etching depth uh, was about 700 nanometers. And actually here we can see a pillar with aspect ratio, uh, ratio of 11. Uh, so I, 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 I have to say that actually the amplification um, uh, of 10 uh, is on the upper end we can achieve using a PPA alone as the etching mask. Another example, uh, we, our collaborators at KIT and EPFL have um, created such uh, 3D face plates for electron optics. So these face plates can simply be, uh, be placed within the um, electron beam in a transmission electron microscope. And then uh, the electron passing through will receive a phase shift depending on the thickness of the face plate. 
um, uh, this can give rise to vortex, vortex beams. It can be used for aberration correction or super resolution imaging. Uh, how they were made? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the 3D pattern was written in PPA as for the previous example. And in this case, the uh, pattern was transferred um, using different chemistries into, into silicon, as can be seen here in the middle, and also into silicon dioxide and into silicon nitride. And finally, the backside uh, of the wafer was etched, etched with KOH to form a suspended um, uh, and electron transparent uh, 3D membranes that could then be inserted uh, in the TEM. Uh, and here's a nice paper about it published last year, uh, if you're interested in more, more details. Now, uh, the question arises, so what is the kind of maximum uh, uh, transferring depth for such 3D patterns that I have just shown? Uh, well, let, let's have a, to understand that uh, limitation. Let's have a look at, uh, at one of the cantilevers in an SCM uh, more closer. So actually, if we zoom into the very tip of the cantilever, Here's the nose of the cantilever, and we can see that the tip is actually not located exactly at the nose of the cantilever, but there's a couple of micrometers uh, offset. Uh, this is because of the way the heaters are designed and how the current is passing through uh, within the cantilever. Then actually, we also have to approach the surface uh, at a certain angle because we want to make sure that the tip uh, will hit the, the sample surface first and not some other part uh, of the cantilever. And actually, this gives rise to the maximum patterning depth, uh, which is, uh, yeah, depending a little bit on the length of the tip exactly and on the um, angle we are uh, using here. But it, it will uh, uh, anyway be in the range of less than 250 nanometers. And as I already mentioned earlier, the selectivity we can achieve uh, using PPA alone as etching mask is uh, maximum uh, 10 about that. So we get the maximum, uh, very maximum uh, depth uh, for transferred structures in the range of a few micrometers or so. But sometimes even deeper structures uh, would be uh, required. So again, our um, customers at EPFL have been working uh, on a process that uh, can be used to amplify the structures. And in this process, um, an intermediate hard mask material uh, is added just underneath the, the PPA at MMA stack between the uh, just uh, under on top of the substrate. In the etching process, so in this case, uh, silicon dioxide has been used, and the the structures from the PPA has been has been transferred to the silicon dioxide first uh, using a helium hydrogen C four F eight process. And then the um, uh, silicon dioxide uh, acts as the hard mask uh, for the next etching step, where the uh, uh, transfer transfer is carried out using uh, uh, either 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 RIE or deep reactive ion etcher, and our common silicon etching chemistry SF six C four F eight. And in this case, um, uh, of course, the selectivity uh, between the silicon dioxide and the silicon is is much much larger than selectivity between uh, PPA and silicon dioxide or PPA and silicon, and we can achieve much larger amplification of the patterns. In these couple of example images, uh, so first 35 nanometer uh, deep uh, patterns in PPA were patterned, and after the etching into the silicon dioxide and then further to the silicon, uh, up to four micron deep uh, uh, patterns uh, were achieved. And here's another uh, design that was also transferred. And here's a cross-section image showing uh, uh, several micron uh, uh, etching depth, uh, starting from a few tens of nanometer uh, patterning depth. So we can actually amplify uh, the depth of the patterns uh, by a factor of in excess of 100 uh, using the intermediate hard mask approach. Now, unfortunately, uh, not only the depth of the patterns uh, are is amplified, but also the uh, defects and uh, surface roughness. And towards this end, uh, they uh, developed uh, an a, a iron beam polishing approach, uh, which uses um, a gentle um, argon ion beam for uh, uh, for polishing the substrate after the reactive iron etching process. So here, the argon ions have a small energy of only 700 electron volts, which is relatively small. 
uh, and using this approach, uh, they were able to reduce the um, RMS roughness of the surface uh, from the 3.3 nanometers just after the reactive ion etching to about 1.2 nanometers after the, uh, the polishing by the argon beam. Another even more efficient approach is to actually coat the sample with a thin layer of PMMA just after the uh, reactive ion etching and then apply the ion beam polishing uh, in a process which is called polymer assisted ion beam polishing. Uh, and using this approach, they achieved even, uh, even uh, more uh, smoothening. So from the original value of 4.2, they went to less than one nanometer uh, in, in surface roughness. Uh, and so why does this kind of um, uh, polymer coating then uh, uh, help in uh, smoothening the surfaces? So first of all, it will fill any recesses we have, so kind of plenarize the surface. So we have a more uniform uh, surface erosion, so we don't have uh, 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 difference uh, between the erosion at the top and the bottom of the structures. Uh, we will also have less erosion uh, from reflected ions, as the reflected ions will be uh, then captured uh, by the PMMA layer. And also for the same reason, uh, we have less redep redeposition of sputtered material. At the end of the process, the PMMA uh, is simply uh, dissolved uh, in a solvent and the smooth surface uh, is revealed. I would like to present an, another um, technique uh, for transferring 3D, uh, 3D structures uh, called the template stripping. Um, this was developed at ETH Zurich. It will be uh, published uh, very soon uh, by uh, research carried out by Nolan Lasalin. Uh, so what we can see here is uh, it's a sine wave pattern that we already saw on one of the very first slides. Not exactly the same, but uh, the same kind of geometry. And it has been transferred in, in silver. So how does this process work? So first of all, we have a structure uh, made, the sine wave structure. Uh, in resist, or it can be also transferred uh, in, for example, silicon. And after that, uh, a very thick film of silver is evaporated or can be actually any material that can be evaporated, as I will show on the next slides. The important, is that important, important thing is that it's very, very thick, uh, so that it's fully and conformally uh, coating uh, all, the, all the parts of the structure. And after the evaporation, a glass light uh, as a rigid support is glued on it using an epoxy adhesive. And when the epoxy adhesive has been dried and cured, we can just uh, mechanically peel it off and strip it, uh, hence the name of the technology. Uh, and, and, and we get an exact replica uh, of the pattern uh, in the original uh, resist or silicon. Uh, and this is the, uh, the kind of uh, nice quality you can, you can achieve. And it's matching exactly, as we can see here on the AFM profiles at the bottom right, uh, the desired profile uh, is matching exactly uh, very well with the, uh, the profile in the silver after the stripping, as well as in the etched uh, profile in the silicon, uh, and also the written profile in the PPA. And in this case, the amplification uh, from PPA to silicon has been uh, 4.2. Another example uh, of a sinusoidal grating uh, in silver, a very nice uh, example. <clears throat> uh, the same approach uh, can also be used to replicate uh, structures into titanium dioxide, so uh, uh, the electric material. So in this case, uh, a pattern like this was applied. <clears throat> uh, that, was, that was first etched into, into silicon uh, using uh, a process that gives us one-to-one -one selectivity. Afterwards, um, a layer of gold was evaporated on top to act as an anti-stick layer. Uh, as we know, the adhesion of gold um, without any kind of adhesion layer is, is quite poor on silver. Uh, so I'm sorry, on, on, on silicon. And that's why it can be used uh, to uh, re help releasing the structures. And afterwards, uh, a thick layer of titanium dioxide was evaporated on top and it was stripped uh, mechanically uh, and using the glass light glued on it with epoxy adhesive and finally the gold was etched away using aqua regia and here we have uh, uh, 
the uh, replicated structure, of course, a negative image uh, of the original uh, original structure. And last but not least, I would like to also introduce the electroplating process for a 3D pattern transfer. So here the approach is again relatively simple. So we start with uh, PPA on a substrate, for example, silicon substrate, and we pattern the desired uh, 3D shapes on it. In this case, we have to evaporate a thin seed layer just to, to act as a starting point for the electroplating process. And then we immerse the sample in a electroplating solution. So maybe here it's worth pointing out that the PPA itself is mm, chemically not very stable in acidic and very strong basic solutions. But adding the silver, um, the, the seed layer here, which can be nickel or can be chromium gold or something like that, it, uh, it really helps to protect the PPA from degradation. And we can carry out uh, a nickel or, uh, for example, a nickel plating process. And in the end, we can um, dissolve uh, the PPA in a solvent, or we can just heat it up. And we can, um, if desired, we can also add a back plate uh, to support the nickel uh, structure at the end. And here's an example of a structure that has been electroplated. So this is a topographical map of Switzerland uh, that has been uh, coated in, in um, plated into nickel. And we can see uh, very nicely uh, how the, all the hills, uh, the mountain tops, and the valleys are replicated uh, in it. And this kind of nickel masters uh, can be used uh, um, as templates for injection molding. So injection molding is a technology. It's a very, very high throughput uh, technology. Uh, it's commercially used to make uh, precision plastic parts. Um, um, in the, let's say, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands uh, per hour volume. So here we simply insert our uh, insert, which can be the uh, nickel master in the, in the cavity. Everything is closed very tightly, bolted together, and then uh, uh, polymer is inserted uh, in the cavity with high pressure, and the polymer replicas um, are reproduced in the other side, and they can be removed uh, from the process from the uh, from the uh, apparatus um, uh, in the middle of the process, and the uh, next one can be uh, injected immediately, hence the very high throughput. And here on the bottom right, we can see an AFM image of a, uh, a final structure that has been replicated in plastic. And actually, the all the topography is again reproduced extremely nicely. Uh, again, taking into account that how fast and how high throughput uh, process this is and how small all the features are. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude. So uh, um, I should, you should remember that Nanofraser is capable of uh, uniquely precise 3D grayscale patterning. That's thanks to the uh, uh, closed loop lithography principle and uh, a very powerful uh, feedback algorithms within the software. Now the patterned uh, precise 3D structures can be transferred to underlying substrates using standard reactive iron etching processes. And of course, if the uh, PPA or, uh, is uh, alone is not uh, enough as an etching mask, uh, then also it's possible to first etch it uh, to another material that will enable to achieve depth amplification. So we can achieve amplification in depth of up to 100. Um, I also introduced um, a template stripping approach, which can be used to replicate structures in materials that can be evaporated, and uh, electroplating uh, process that can be uh, applied to uh, materials that can be electroplated. And finally, uh, the Nanofacer process handbook that is uh, available in Nanofacer software uh, contains much more detail on all these processes, uh, also including example recipes that can act as a starting point uh, for process development at our customer sites. And of course, we are available uh, to support you with all your process development uh, at any time. Uh, so thank you for your attention and I look forward to answering your questions.